Good morning, buenos dias. I am Sylvia Partida, the CEO of the National Center for Farm Worker Health, NCFH, North Carolina Community Health Center Association, and Northwest Regional Primary Care Association are your hosts for the 2021 Virtual Forum for Migrant and Community Health. We welcome you. It has been just over a year that our country and the world started confronting COVID-19 and all of our lives have changed. In the last 12 months, we have seen suffering and experienced loss, but we have also seen courage, compassion, commitment, caring, and resilience. We have witnessed the dedication of essential workers across the United States, and we come together at this conference to honor all essential workers and especially agricultural workers whose work ensures we have food on our tables and healthcare workers who are on the front lines committed to the health and safety of our communities. You are our heroes. If we were together physically, we would stop, stand and clap for these heroes. So please, I ask that you take a second to do so. Stand where you are, clap, and show your appreciation. For agricultural workers and healthcare workers joining us today, I ask that you close your eyes, envision a sea of people, a standing ovation, and hear a thunderous applause. Now I'm gonna hand it over to my colleagues, Bruce Gray and Chris Shanks. Bruce? Thanks, Sylvia, and uh, buenos dias y bienvenidos to all of you on the call here. We're just delighted to have you involved. I'm Bruce Gray, the CEO of the Northwest Regional Primary Care Association, one of the, the co-hosts of the conference. Uh, first and foremost, as Sylvia mentioned, I really want to thank all of you, not only for being on this call, but also for everything you do every day, and also really for who you are, um, really your corazón. That's the piece that we absolutely want to honor through these this next five days in the sessions we have. Many of you are on the front lines of serving the most disadvantaged and marginalized populations and members of our society, farm workers, who really, while determined and, and deemed as essential, are often overlooked, ignored, and frankly, sometimes ghosted. And that's hard to say, but it really is. We recognize the, the important work that you're doing and reaching out to that population and really serving folks who particularly over this last year have often been um, it's not, not well served. So really, I also wanna thank all of your colleagues who are not on this call and really have been out there serving as well next to you. We heard from a number that they would love to have been here, but because of what's going on, they really didn't have the opportunity or the time to do so. So really, not only all of you, but also your, your colleagues um, we are at NWRPCA so deeply honored and humbled to be your colleagues. Um, really keep up the great work um, and si se puede. Just keep keep doing what you can. It's really the most important thing. I also just quickly want to thank Chris and Sylvia and their teams for a terrific partnership here. Um, we together have, have provided over the last 35 years almost 100 forums across the, the East, the Midwest, and the West. And also really to thank my own team at NWRPCA, Seth Doyle, our Director of Strategic Initiatives, Maribel, um, our Community Health Improvement Program Manager, and um, Emily, our Education and Training, and her team, and all the folks at NWRPCA have done this, as well as the regional planning committees for each of the three forums that have come together. And, and also, very significantly, really to thank Jim and Alfonso, Jim from the U.S. Bureau of Primary Health Care, and Alfonso from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for being here, for, for being the organizations that really do care and are stepping forward and speaking with you today. So thank you guys very much for that. And I'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Bruce. And uh, thank you for um, you and your team support in this and co-hosting this conference. I appreciate all the things that you have, have, have done. And I wanna say good morning and a warm welcome from North Carolina to the first annual virtual forum for migrant and community health. I am Chris Shank, the CEO of the North Carolina Community Health Center Association, the primary care association for North Carolina. NCCHCA started the East Coast Migrant Dream Forum in 1988, 
And last year was my first time attending this forum, and it immediately became my favorite conference. And not because it was in Puerto Rico, that was a value add, but however, the East Coast Conference Forum really speaks to the heart of who we are and what we do in serving our communities. So I would like to welcome back those of you I spent time with at East Coast Migrant Stream Forum in Puerto Rico last year, and I'm glad to meet the rest of you for the first time. You know, my grandparents were farmers right here in North Carolina, and I spent a lot of summers uh, working on their farms. So I understand the lives of, of agriculture workers and, and how important they are to our economy. But in this year, after a change in administration and near what we hope is the end of an earth shaking pandemic, discussing migrant health is absolutely critical. Harvesting vegetables, fruit, grains, poultry work, seafood work, work in greenhouses, all are essential to a continuation of our daily lives. The entire United States economy and food system would not have made it through last year without these workers. So let's take a moment now to appreciate the workers that we hope to serve throughout this conference. You know, several years ago, um, in partnership with our allies along the East Coast, we came up with a tagline um, from a take on the commercial, you got milk. I hope you all remember that. Um, it was, you got food, thank a farmer. A farm worker feed the world. It is in this same spirit that we come together today across the nation, support and access healthcare to all. We are a united front, so I encourage you to rise up, step up, be present and celebrate. I hope you are inspired and rejuvenated through this year virtual migrant and community health forum. Thank you for joining us during this challenging time and hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you. And I'm too. Thank you, Chris. And uh, before continuing with the program, I'd like to cover a few brief housekeeping items. Your lines will be muted throughout the presentation today. If you have any questions or comments, please post them in the chat box uh, to everyone. Questions will be addressed during the Q&A portion at the end of each presentation. Second, this plenary session is being recorded. It will be posted in our virtual forum learning vault for you to review in the future. And each of the breakout sessions will have interpretation services provided. Once you join a session, you can select the English or the Spanish option from the world icon on your control panel, which will be located at the bottom of your screen. If at any time assistance is needed, please reach out to the session moderator using the chat feature. And lastly, the views and opinions presented in today's program are those of our invited speakers based on their professional experience and expertise. And we also want to extend our sincere gratitude this year more than ever for the support of our partners, sponsors, and colleagues in the wonderful work of our community health centers. Please take a look at our highlighted sponsors. We express our appreciation for the generous support of our sponsors and exhibitors. Our champion sponsor, Community Health Ventures, Advocate Level, South Carolina Primary Care Association, and Central Valley Area Health Education Center. And our friend level, Amerigroup Washington and MHP Salud. And our many educational session sponsors. Please show your appreciation by visiting the booths during the breaks throughout the conference and gain points for prizes too. And last, but certainly not least, we'd like to thank the track planning committees who helped plan the content and session for this year's conference. And of course, our terrific staff from NCFH, NWRPCA, and NCCHCA. And now I'll hand it back to Thank you, Sylvia. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for today, Jim McCray, Associate Administrator of the Bureau of Primary Healthcare. Mr. McCray has led the Health Resources and Services Administration's Bureau of Primary Healthcare for more than 10 years. 
He manages a $5.6 billion budget supporting nearly 13,000 health center service delivery sites, which provide high quality primary health care to nearly 30 million people nationwide. He also served as the HRSA acting administrator from April 2015 to April 2017. Prior to his years in BPHC, Mr. McRae served as associate administrator for HRSA's Office of Performance Review from 2000 to 2006, where he oversaw the work of staff in regional divisions across the country, working to improve HRSA's supported programs in states and communities. Mr. McRae has received numerous awards, including the Secretary's Award for Distinguished Service, Hubert H. Humphrey Award for Service to America, the HRSA Administrator's Award for Equal Opportunity Achievement, and the Presidential Meritorious Executive Rank Award. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology from Illinois Wesleyan University, a Master of Arts in Sociology from Duke University, and a Master of Public Health degree from Harvard University. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Great. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, it's such an honor to be here today um, with all of you essential workers all across the country. Um, uh, as you've heard from Bruce and Chris and Sylvia, we can't thank you enough for all the amazing work that you've done in what has been an extremely difficult year um, this past year. Um, your courage, your commitment, your dedication um, has meant saving people's lives all across this country. But I really do want to recognize that we have lost too many lives this year. Um, we've lost a number of patients that have been seen at our migrant health centers across the country. We've lost providers. We've lost staff. We've lost family members. We've lost friends. Um, it's been an incredibly difficult and challenging year. And again, repeatedly, day after day, you have stepped into the danger. You have provided services and you have saved as many lives as you possibly could. And without you, I'm not sure where we would be as a country uh, in terms of your work. So I really do want to honor and thank you for all of the incredible contributions that you've made over the years, but really the incredible work that you've done in the past year. Now we do have um, glimmers of hope. Um, hopefully it will turn into bright lights uh, in terms of what's going on with the vaccine um, so that we can get into a much better place. Um, but again, we're going to call upon you to help with this effort um, to get as many of our migrant seasonal farm workers across the country vaccinated as quickly as possible um, to help protect them, their family, and their friends. So let's, um, if we can, let's jump in. Actually, if we can go to the next slide in terms of the presentation. Um, what I'm excited to share with you is some information about a direct to health center vaccine program that's just been recently established. Um, also want to share a new effort um, to actually provide masks to our health centers all across the country. Um, I know many folks are also interested in the American Rescue Plan Act and some resources that will be provided to our health centers. Um, and then just a couple of program updates in terms of the work that we do. If we can go to the next slide. So the first thing, um, and this program is relatively new, um, it actually did not exist two months ago, um, but it has been stood up and you'll see in just another slide or so, we've actually gotten a million doses delivered to our health centers um, through this program. Um, but the first thing I just wanted to share about this program itself is that when we met with our colleagues in the White House, um, we had some strong conversations about what was the focus of this particular initiative and we talked about, is it to increase the number of people that are vaccinated, or is it really a focus on equity? And overwhelmingly and consistently, we have said that this program really is about assuring equity in vaccine distribution and administration. And that is the whole lens that we're focused on. You can see from Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith that equity is our North Star, um, and she's leading the overall efforts around equity um, for the White House. And this program really is designed to do that activity. It's also meant to supplement or complement the state allocations that health centers are receiving, but it is designed to provide vaccines directly to health centers where we know people can benefit um, from this service. Um, we initially started with 250 health centers. We just in the last week have expanded it to an additional 700 health centers that have been invited to the program. Um, if we can go to the next slide. And I think, you know, really what I want to stress here with this slide is that that first phase um, 
with that equity lens, we made the decision that we wanted to focus on those health centers that were serving some of our most vulnerable populations. So it included people experiencing homelessness, it included residents of public housing, it included people that had limited English proficiency and challenges with navigating the um, social media, the web portals that people have to go into, but it also recognized migrant and seasonal farm workers, agricultural workers as a key population for getting the vaccines out. And I will tell you the good news is that through this program, um, we're already starting to see some of the results. In fact, um, of the patients that have been vaccinated, have, have received vaccines through this program, 23% are individuals with limited English proficiency, 12% are migrant and seasonal farm workers, 5% are residents of public housing, and 2% are people experiencing homelessness. So. You have taken the vaccines that you've received through this program and you are providing it to the individuals that have that most need. If we can go to the next slide. So this does on this slide provide an overview of where we are to date. So um, we wanted to initially reach at least a million doses. Um, we just passed that threshold this weekend. So we have um, administered um, about 1.1 million doses have been uh, provided to our health centers. Um, that's going to a little over 1,069 sites across the country, um, and we're continuing to ramp this program up. So just this past weekend, we were able to deliver about 400,000 doses out of that 1.1 million. Um, the goal ultimately is to provide it to all health centers uh, in terms of their um, receipt of this vaccine. If we can go to the next slide. Um, looks like we're having maybe some challenges with that, so I'll just speak uh, if, if the slide's not coming up. But in terms of the second phase of the program, um, what we're reaching out to are those health centers that are serving other high-need populations. Um, and this includes people that are serving um, high levels of people who are low-income and minority populations. We also wanted to make sure that our rural communities were being reached uh, by the program, so going out to rural and frontier communities. We also wanted to make sure that we were supporting our Native American programs that we have here in the, in the Bureau of Primary Health Care, so health centers that have a relationship with a tribal or urban Indian program. And then, as we all know, the importance of going out into the communities, so also working with health centers that have mobile vans. If we could just go to the next slide, just I think that has that information on it for you. And I think that's what's really important about all of this, um, and you're going to hear it over and over again the importance of that trusted messenger, um, the trusted provider, um, that's what ultimately makes the difference. Yes, the PR pieces, the leadership messages are really important, but it's you on the front lines, talking to your patients, um, going out into the community, talking about what the science shows in terms of the vaccines, addressing people's concerns where they are, and just encouraging people because it makes sense and it will ultimately protect them that's what's going to get us past the whole issues of vaccine confidence. And we really are counting on you to help us with that message and to get vaccines um, into these communities where it's most needed. So again, can't thank you enough um, for the work that you all are doing. If we can go to the next slide. So this provides an overview of where we are overall with the health center program. So you can see on this slide, we've done about 2.2 million initial vaccines, which is great. Um, and of those where we know race and ethnicity, um, over 56% are racial and ethnic minorities. So again, really making sure that we're reaching those populations that have been most uh, impacted by um, COVID-19 is really the goal. If we can go to the next slide. So this shows vaccines that are actually been completed. So we've done a little over one point or close to 1.1 million vaccines through the health center program. And again, about 51% are going into uh, are going for racial and ethnic minority populations, which again is something that we are keeping focused on. Um, one of the things we said early on with this program was we wanted to keep track not just of the numbers, but whether we were reaching the populations that we all said were the most important to reach. And so uh, we've been really keeping that as our North Star. If we can go to the next slide. Um, one of the other things that's been recognized is just the critical importance of migrant uh, health centers, other community health centers in terms of providing um, resources to their patient population. And over the next several weeks, we're actually going to be providing masks to all of our health centers across the country to be able to provide to your patients and their family members, uh, because getting vaccinated is critically important, as we all know. 
but it's not the only step that needs to be taken. We need to continue to wear masks. We need to continue to keep social distance. We need to continue to, to focus on good hygiene and washing your hands. But one of the things that we wanted to make sure of as an administration is that you all had the resources that you could share with your patients. So please know that those are gonna be coming very soon, shortly um, out there um, for you to provide to your patients, to your staff, um, and into the larger community. So very excited about that opportunity. Um, let's go to the next slide. So I know folks are very excited about um, and interested in the American Rescue Plan Act. So um, you see a lot of the different funding opportunities that we have here um, for the Bureau of Primary Healthcare, and I'll talk about a couple of those, but I wanna spend most of my time talking about the American Rescue Act. So it is gonna provide a total of $7.6 billion um, to the health center program Again, an incredible recognition of the work that health centers do, um, not just with COVID, but really with providing essential preventive and primary health care services to their patient populations. And this investment, I think, is a true recognition of that work. Um, these resources will be available to our funded health centers, as well as our FQHC lookalikes and the Native Hawaiian program. And it will support activities um, for both services as well as capital um, infrastructure grants. So we anticipate, and Sylvia, I saw sort of smiled when I said it, soon, shortly, getting the first availability of resources out, um, a big chunk of those resources will be going out very soon, shortly. Um, and that will support everything from vaccines, um, all the costs associated with that, including outreach going out into the community. Um, it will also provide support for testing and treatment. We know many of you have been involved um, for many months now in both testing and treatment. It will also help you maintain your services. And we do anticipate that there will be um, a pent up demand um, for services as we go along um, and as people feel more comfortable coming back. In fact, we know of many health centers right now that are using that 15 minute window um, in between, you know, making sure that there's no allergic reaction to actually ask people, are their prescriptions up to date? Have they done any kind of screenings that maybe they haven't done? Can we set up an appointment for you all to come in, you know, in a couple of months? Um, a lot of health centers are doing a lot of work in that space, so we want to be able to support you. It also has resources to support um, mobile vans, um, so even the purchase of mobile vans, um, as well as basic infrastructure. And then last but not least, um, support around outreach and enrollment. I mean, outreach and education, which is critically important in terms of our work. Um, in addition to that, we've done several new investments this year. Um, the one I just wanted to spend a minute on are two. Um, was the National Hypertension uh, Control Initiative. Um, this was resources that we provided to our health centers that are having um, the most challenges with having working with people to get their, back, uh, get their hypertension under control. Um, what we're excited about in this effort is that we're actually working with those health centers that are having the biggest struggles. And what we're doing is really a different approach where we're involving the patients more directly in their care so the whole idea behind this initiative is to actually do remote patient monitoring um, and actually provide devices directly to patients so that they can monitor and track their own blood pressure and work with peers and their providers to actually um, get their hypertension more in control. And we see this as a real potential um, game changer in terms of the work that we do. Um, we also are working, of course, around ending HIV, um, and we've expanded an opportunity to actually uh, engage up to 170 health centers uh, in this effort to do more around HIV prevention. Um, if we can go to the next slide, so I'm not going to spend much time on this. This is just uh, for those who are grantees. Um, just know with all of these resources, there's, there's going to be a lot of attention. So please just make sure that you present your information to us about what your community needs and how you're going to address it. And then just continue to report into us all the great accomplishments and achievements that you've done. Um, if we can go to the next slide, speaking of great achievements, um, we were so happy last year um, in the Migrant Health Center program to actually reach that milestone of serving over 1 million uh, migrant seasonal farm workers across the country. We had set that as a goal, I think about four or five years ago. I think Bobby Ryder was uh, the sort of key driver on that, but it would not have happened without Bobby, Bobby's leadership and all of the work that folks have done all across the country. And so it's just really an incredible threshold for us. Um, and again, a testament to the great work that health centers across the country are doing. Um, right now, uh, migrant seasonal farm workers are about three and a half percent of our overall patient population. 
And we hope that that uh, population continues to grow in terms of our national data. Let's go to the next slide. So um, just want to wrap up with um, two last uh, points with you all, um, which, you know, you all are experiencing this directly. Um, we were very worried about our primary health care workforce before COVID, um, the increasing demands on primary health care providers, staff, um, the increasing expectations, the challenges with reimbursement. We were concerned about that before COVID, and with COVID, it has just uh, grown exponentially. And one of the things that we want to do over the next year, working with you, with Sylvia, with Bruce, with Chris, all the folks across the country, um, is really to do a renewed effort around looking at our workforce and how can we support you. Um, you've been incredibly resilient, but it has not come without a price. And we wanna make sure that we are as best we can supporting you at the individual health center level, at the state level, at the regional level, and at the national level. One of the big things that we're gonna do over the next year is to do an overall staff satisfaction survey to really create a baseline for us to be able to move forward to support our staff. Because at the end of the day, it's staff that makes all of this work. Um, it's not the money, it's not the resources, it's the staff that translate those dollars into real patient care and real improvements in terms of health outcomes. And if we don't support you, we're not doing our job. Um, and lastly, um, if we can go to the next slide, uh, we are, of course, taking a greater look at some of the social determinants of health. Um, COVID has absolutely put a spotlight on existing health inequities, health disparities, um, injustice that's occurring in healthcare and beyond. And we know that it's critically important that our health centers are involved in this work. Um, and we want to figure out how we can best support you. And again, our patients to deal with issues related to food insecurity, housing insecurity, um, social service needs, all of those different pieces. So um, we want to continue to do that work with you and are excited about it. If we can go to the next slide, I think that's the end of my presentation, and I will turn it back over to Sylvia, um, but just say again a huge thank you. I can't thank you enough and honor you for all of the incredible work that you've done, and we look forward to our continued partnership, um, getting vaccines out right now, um, but also addressing the longer-term needs of our patient populations and, and really meeting the needs of our communities um, and uh, absolutely essential migrant seasonal farm workers all across the country. So. Thank you again, and thank you, Sylvia. So thank you so much, Jim, and uh, really great information to share. And um, we certainly appreciate having an update on, on the programs. And, and of course, we um, love your phrase, uh, um, soon, shortly. So uh, lots of things to happen very soon, shortly. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Rodriguez Lines is an epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention with CDC Division of Global Migration and Quarantine, the US Mexico unit. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez's main responsibilities include acting as a liaison, planner, and coordinator for Latino migrant health activities for the division in collaboration with other federal, state, and international partners. In that role, he leads efforts to increase awareness and evidence about health disparities experienced by Latino migrants in the U.S. Two main areas of focus have been enhancing public health surveillance of Latino migrants and emergency communication with non-English speaking populations. Since March 2020, Dr. Rodriguez Lines has led CDC initiatives to address farm workers' needs related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Prior to joining CDC, Dr. Rodriguez Lines was the senior epidemiologist for the Office of Binational Border Health, California Department of Public Health. Dr. Rodriguez received his PhD in epidemiology, master's in preventive veterinary medicine from the University of California at Davis, and his DVM from the School of Veterinary Medicine in Cordoba, Spain. He has co-authored many peer-reviewed publications and reports on border and Latino migrant health issues. Welcome so much, Dr. Rodriguez Lines. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Sylvia. Real honor and also a pleasure to be participating in this uh, <clears throat> plenary 
National Forum on Agricultural Health and Migrant Health uh, uh, Issues. It's also a pleasure to share with uh, some of my colleagues from HERSA and from other some of the farm worker uh, serving organizations uh, to participate in this uh, in this plenary. Uh, I want to say first that I will, uh, I will follow up some of the great work that our colleague from uh, HERSA, Jim McRae, has uh, introduced to you, shared with you about the great work that they're doing in terms of access to healthcare and health services for agricultural workers in, in the U.S. I'm going to be talking to you about some of the work that the CDC has been doing, some of the specific projects or initiatives focused on agricultural workers and, uh, and COVID-19. Um, but before that, I want to say that any and all of the activities or initiatives I will be describing to you will not work if it's no through collaboration with all of you, with our partner, farm workers serving organizations, and, you know, all of you working in the field, doing great work, working in the community health centers, and also in collaboration with our federal uh, federal partners. So we're going to start with our first uh, next slide, please. Okay. So we have heard several times uh, this morning about uh, agricultural workers being considered essential, critical infrastructure uh, workers. Uh, there is an estimated 2.5 million hired agricultural workers in the U.S. I specifically mentioned here a subgroup, uh, the H2A temporary agricultural workers that are of particular interest to my division, the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine. There is close to 300,000 of every year come to the U.S. for seasonal work. And they are particularly interest for us because uh, they are mostly coming from uh, from Mexico and having identified some of the most vulnerable, uh, you know, agricultural worker uh, uh, communities. But unfortunately, they're not only agricultural workers are essential critical infrastructure workers, but also we know they're a high risk or higher risk of COVID-19 for other uh, than other compared to other populations. They uh, work and live in overcrowded conditions. They share transportation. Immigration status is a barrier to access to care, uh, low socioeconomic status, limited access to healthcare services, and other factors uh, increase the risk of uh, agricultural workers uh, related to COVID-19. Next slide, please. Now, unfortunately, even though we know that, uh, there is relatively limited published data on the burden of COVID-19 among agricultural workers in the U.S. And one of the reasons is because uh, still we don't have really a good uh, surveillance or monitoring system to assess the burden in terms of diseases, hospitalization, uh, death among farm workers in the U.S. Uh, there are many multiple reports of deaths in outbreaks, mostly coming from the news media. Uh, uh, fortunately, in recent months, there have been uh, an increasing number of local surveys or state surveys that not have, have not only documented the barriers of access to testing, treatment, housing, and protective uh, uh, equipment among farm workers, but also in some cases uh, have identified a high uh, infectious disease rate uh, compared to other uh, uh, occupational uh, workers in other occupations. We know also that fortunately there are many uh, organizations serving agricultural workers, very dedicated, and many of you are participating, or all of you uh, are working in those organizations are participating in this, uh, uh, in this call. Uh, but at least in my opinion, the, there's not really a lot of coordinated uh, activities or plans among all of those different organizations. Uh, and also, uh, obviously, the needs are great, and the capacity to address those needs by individual organizations uh, uh, is limited. Next slide. So that's what I wanted to uh, share with you, some of the initiatives that the CDC has been implementing, again, specific to agricultural workers and uh, COVID-19, and uh, uh, trying to address some of the uh, issues or needs of agricultural workers in this uh, pandemic. Next slide. But first, to give you a little bit of context, uh, the CDC, when there is a public health emergency, the, like the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, immediately uh, uh, the emergency operations center is activated. And within that emergency operations center, there's a very complex uh, structure of uh, task forces and teams within those task forces that are focused on differing uh, aspects of uh, the response, and that includes laboratory, clinical issues, guidance, policy, uh, worker safety, and also include uh, uh, for the first time a health equity office to address 
health equity dis or disparities in the in COVID-19 and in and, and, and the US. So there are multiple task forces and teams, but there is really no one specific uh, dedicated or, or with a lead or only dedicated to, to fund workers. So for that reason, we have established a fund worker interest group that includes representatives from the multiple task forces that have anything to do or interested in the in, in fund worker uh, populations to share information and also to coordinate activities, not only across the CTC, but also with other federal agencies. Next slide, please. So in this presentation, I would like to describe to you some of the uh, main initiatives, again, focus on agricultural workers being implemented by the, by the CDC in partnership with other uh, organizations. So first, uh, I will talk about uh, the development and publishing of uh, prevention guidance. Uh, second, uh, the CDC has been providing technical support to health departments and other organizations. We have established a partnership with fund workers serving organizations. I will then describe uh, an assessment of mobility patterns about the cultural workers that we're implementing right now, and also an initiative to focus on H2A agricultural workers and prevention strategies to address those issues of those uh, specific population. Next slide, please. So first, one of the main roles or responsibilities of CDC during a public, during a public health emergency is to obtain and use the best evidence available to develop, to develop guidance documents that will help uh, jurisdictions uh, and, and organizations uh, and, the, and the public to uh, implement uh, prevention and control uh, uh, you know, strategies to mitigate uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, across populations in the U.S. And the CDC has developed, in collaboration with other agencies, a number of guidance documents. And here you can see a list of them with links. You will be able to, to access them. And uh, specifically related to agricultural workers and employers, and a number of tools to uh, facilitate the implementation of those uh, uh, recommendations. And just here at the right, you have an example of a toolkit uh, that, that helps an assessment to uh, a control plan to to, to 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 help employers to implement an assessment control plan in their in their in their farms. Uh, we are also working right now to develop a specific web page and toolkit specific to H two A workers and employers that will be available very soon. It will include also educational materials and messages in a number of uh, uh, different media that will be focused on H two A workers. Next slide, please. The other main activity that the CDC does during a public health emergency is to provide technical support to health departments and organizations related to different issues. In this case, uh, we have multiple uh, webinars, listening sessions, uh, conference calls with uh, employers, organizations serving uh, uh, agricultural workers, uh, and uh, we have an opportunity to meet with different CDC experts uh, and different topics and to provide advice and recommendations and to uh, identify first their needs and also to try to find out the best way to address those uh, those needs. Last month, last week, for example, we had uh, a call with uh, four Western health departments and uh, to discuss vaccination strategies for uh, migrant fund workers uh, in those uh, uh, states. So we have experts from the vaccination team and the CDC uh, to hear their needs and also to try to come up with uh, appropriate solutions to address those needs. The CDC also develops uh, teams to the field to assist uh, with uh, the health departments and jurisdictions with uh, surveillance, data analysis, community assessments, outbreak investigations. And here you see some examples in Washington State, California, and Arizona, where uh, the CDC has de uh, deployed teams of uh, epidemiologists and health communicators and others to assist uh, jurisdiction, particularly to respond to outbreaks. Right now we have a team in Juma County, uh, Arizona, and they're also helping to come up with a plan to, uh, uh, a strategic plan to vaccinate uh, migrant uh, fund workers in that uh, in that county. We are in the process also to develop together with the NCFH, the National Center for Fund Worker Health, an agricultural dashboard that will put together uh, critical information that is needed by jurisdiction and organizations to better target design and target their uh, their strategies to outreach 
uh, and provide services to farm workers. That include the number of agricultural workers in the county, number of farms, the type of farms and locations, uh, where the community health centers are located, where the uh, what kind of farm worker serving organizations are in a certain area. So again, we hope to uh, to be able to provide this uh, dashboard very uh, very very soon. Next slide, please. But what I'm very uh, more excited about is very relevant to this uh, to this conference is that uh, we have established uh, for the first time. Uh, a CDC partnership with a national network of fund workers serving organizations. Uh, this is a five-year cooperative agreement. Uh, we have secured funding for the first year, fiscal year 21, almost $8 million of funding. And we are right now securing funding for the rest of the uh, five years of the cooperative agreement. Uh, this project is being coordinated through the National Center for Fund Worker Health but again, it's focused on a national network of fund workers serving organizations. And the objective of this project is to strengthen the organization's public health emergency, outreach and response coordination and capacity, but also to establish again, a very uh, uh, a strong and comprehensive uh, partnership with the CDC, not only uh, throughout this response that also we will be able to continue after the response to in preparation for any future emergencies, but also to be used for other uh, addressing other issues of uh, health issues of fund workers. Next slide, please. So in this slide here, you can see, let me see, just quickly double check to make sure that uh, we are exactly perfect. Okay, I want to confirm that we are in the right, uh, in the right slide. So this slide here is a representation of uh, the, the network that we have established Again, it's being coordinated through the National Center for Farm Worker Health. They have uh, created a, an advisory council, a National Agricultural Worker Advisory Council, to provide recommendations and uh, uh, in terms of this partnership that we have established. It has 18 members that includes uh, farm workers and representatives from multiple uh, organizations serving farm workers. There is a group of core partners that are receiving funding. Each of the core partners that you, you see here are specialized in specific uh, areas of work. And you can recognize that some of them are working, all these partners are working very closely through uh, uh, with HRSA. Uh, and also we have a number of strategic partners beyond those core partners that will help this uh, network to be more efficient uh, with the goal again to, uh, to reach out and increase the capacity to reach out and provide uh, prevention services to the farm worker community. I want to highlight that this is a, a two-way communication, so it's not just from the top to the bottom, but also it's really a two-way because we want to, it's a way to hear from the farm worker community, from the strategic partners, uh, 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 what are the needs and, 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 and how the, the initiatives and strategies that we are implementing are working. And then this national network, we see as, uh, again, the close collaboration with the CDC and also with uh, other uh, federal and state, uh, and state agencies. In the CDC, we have identified a core team of uh, experts that are providing technical uh, support to the uh, to the network to the organizations who are members of the of the network. And myself, I, I am one of the technical monitors in this uh, in this project. Next slide, please. So some of the strategy, uh, strategies of this uh, partnership that we have established, uh, again led by NCFS, but also with uh, national network of organizations is first to develop and implement a national outreach plan. As I mentioned to you, one of the challenges is that there is no lot of coordination among the, uh, the different agencies or organizations serving farm workers. So we're trying through this project to come out with, uh, uh, with a more coordinated plan where uh, includes a combination of local outreach through the partner organization that will be participating and also using uh, radio and social media at the national level to be able to be more efficient uh, and, uh, and, and coordinating and, and, and outreaching to fund workers. We are also going to be uh, developing and, and implementing training uh, of the outreach uh, staff and those organizations who are members of the, of the network and also to provide the needed resources in terms of materials, educational materials, PPE, and also some of the technology needed by the outreach staff to be able to do better their, uh, their work. A number of their organizations, an increasing number, uh, is going to be receiving uh, direct funding, subcontracting, 
uh, receiving funding to be able to implement the, the activities that would be uh, identified in this national outreach plan. Something very exciting also, through this project, we are going to be conducting rapid national and regional assessments that will provide uh, representative samples uh, from fund workers across the US using phone surveys and key informant interviews to monitor knowledge, attitude, and practices of the fund workers and employers related to prevention behaviors and very importantly, vaccination coverage to, to be able to, to, to assess if we're really reaching our goals of vaccinating fund workers in, in, in the country. Next slide, please. To be able to uh, uh, to guide the, the, the national plan that I've mentioned before, we are conducting in collaboration with the partners organizations and needs assessments of uh, fund workers needs related to COVID-19, uh, using a literature review, key informal interviews, and also feedback from the advisory council. We also conducting an assessment of uh, training needs of community health workers. We all know, uh, I don't need to tell you the importance of community health workers, promotoras, promotores, and outreaching our, our communities, our fund worker communities, and developing training resources based on those uh, on those needs. Again, the idea here is not to duplicate work that may be already being done, but to complement uh, uh, you know, resources that could be used across the national network of organizations. Next slide, please. One of the roles of this uh, uh, partnership that we have with this uh, uh, network of organizations is to adapt the CDC guidance. I mentioned to you about the CDC developing guidance to, uh, to, to make recommendations about uh, prevention and control to COVID-19 among the fund workers and, and, and employers. Uh, but obviously, sometimes those uh, guidance can be technical or too technical. And uh, it's very, very important that, that we get feedback from the organizations in the ground to make sure that the guidance is adapted and really responds and is useful to the uh, uh, employers, uh, fund workers, and organizations that need to, uh, will be asking to implement those gui th that guidance. And so we make the, the, the guidance as effective and useful as possible. Uh, in collaboration with NCFH, we also developed a, a directory for organizations uh, serving fund workers. And you can see on the right, it's already available on the website, NCFH website. You can find in uh, by location. You can identify the organizations that are focused on fund workers uh, with their location and also the uh, description of the type of organization and contact information. So that can really help uh, coordination and collaboration of organizations uh, that, that are serving uh, fund workers. We have also developed an inv inventory of existing educational resources for fund workers related to COVID-19. Uh, not try to have everything that is available, but really try to find the, what is considered some of the high quality material that we consider to be the most useful. And also we are developing together with NCFH, uh, new educational materials and also with our health and human services partners and other agencies, materials that, uh, that complement uh, or fill some of the gaps in educational materials that are focused on, on the needs of agricultural workers and the organization serving them. Next slide, please. Something that I'm very excited also is that we know that many of you, organizations, uh, both farm workers serving organizations, employ employers, community health centers, and also uh, community health departments, uh, health departments uh, are implementing promising practices, but they're not really uh, well known or advertised. Uh, and so there is a risk that we may be reinventing the wheel. Some of the promising practices are not, are not known by other organizations that could use them or adapt them. So one of the projects or initiatives that we have is to identify and publish uh, promising practices by employers, uh, health departments, organizations related to testing, isolation, transportation, uh, et cetera, and now specifically focus on vaccination strategies that can be then, the, again, adapted or used by other organizations. So we don't want to re reinvent the wheel. Uh, through this project, we are also supporting the implementation of those promising practices, and one of them is an uh, expansion of the 1-800 call center that is already in place, but we're going to be expanding that, expanding that. Uh, they will provide uh, information to, to fund workers and employers and also assist with vaccination registration. And also part of this project is that we will be uh, selecting uh, a number of uh, demonstration projects to implement uh, promising practices across the country. Next slide. 
one of the challenges that we have, and I'm sure you're very well, uh, very well aware, is that some of our workers are highly mobile, uh, uh, not only uh, across the country, but also they're coming from other from other countries to come to work to the U.S. But unfortunately, some of the data that we have, as the, the map that I'm showing here on the right, is outdated, uh, is poorly documented. And uh, so right now, we don't have, really have a very good information about the mobility of farm workers, both within the U.S. and also across uh, other countries. So, and that's critical information to be able to, uh, to conduct outreach and also to implement any prevention uh, strategy. So we have a project that we are implementing right now in collaboration with Mexico and U.S. experts, where we are, we are analyzing the, 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 best, the, the most best information that we have, current information, to try to assess and document the mobility patterns of uh, farm workers uh, in the U.S. Using data sources, existing data sources, key informants, participatory mapping, and then in collaboration of uh, experts from both countries. And this information will be available uh, to all of you uh, soon. Another initiative, next slide, please. Uh, another initiative I want to highlight is a pilot project that also we're very excited. It's focused on H2A workers. And uh, this is a pilot free voluntary COVID-19 testing that is being uh, overseen by my division, the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine. It's implemented in Mexico while the workers are still in Mexico through panel physicians. These are the physicians who conduct immigration uh, screening before uh, immigrants come to the U.S. to live in the U.S. In this case, we'll be focused on H-2A workers. It's been done with collaboration with uh, a number of U.S. farm employers and with the consulate, U.S. consulates in Mexico. So the testing, again, is provided free to them. Uh, the participants also receive health education and information about access to care once they come to the U.S. Those testing positives are reported to the Mexico as required by Mexican laws to the local health department to take any uh, mitigation uh, or prevention the measures they need to take. And right now, uh, those workers that test positive are supposed to be isolated. And the, right now, uh, the, the housing is provided for free uh, by the employers uh, in Mexico. Uh, there is also the potential to this project to also to add other prevention strategies like prevention, like vaccination. So in summary, again, these are just some of the main initiatives that we are, uh, you know, implementing across the CDC to that are focus on agricultural workers. And that, I think, shows that the CDC recognizes agricultural workers as a priority population for preparedness and response during emergencies, including pandemics. But it's critical, we also recognize that it's critical to establish and to expand the, the partnership that we have right now with a national network of farm workers serving organizations as the, the way to be more effective in improving uh, community outreach and response to this community. And to do that, we need sustained support, both in terms of funding and technical assistance from the CDC and other agencies. It's also critical to have a coordinated activities among organizations and also with other federal agencies, something that we are working right now and looking forward, specifically with our colleagues in HRSA, to expand our collaboration. And also it's critical to uh, continue to have ongoing monitoring and evaluation of agricultural workers' access to, uptake of, and knowledge and attitudes to war prevention uh, measures. And also we believe that this is a very exciting opportunity with through this partnership and expansion of this partnership to also again to be used for future emergencies, but also for non-emergency health uh, issues, and also so we're working very closely to uh, to do that. So to finalize, again, as I indicated from the beginning, uh, the, the health of farm workers in the U.S. is not only important because uh, as to secure uh, uh, the food and uh, the national food uh, uh, chain in our country, uh, but also because uh, they are uh, a critical population that are integral members of our community, and also by addressing the, the, the health needs of farm workers during the pandemic, we're also helping to address uh, disparities, racial, I think, disparities that have been so obvious during this uh, during this pandemic. So I want to stop here. So thank you very much to uh, all of you for uh, listening to this participation and for the opportunity to uh, to give to to share with you some of the work done by the CDC. So thank you very much, and I open for any questions. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Lyons. Uh, we truly appreciate your participation in our opening plenary. 
And again, I'm Sylvia Gomez, Stream Form and Distance Learning Coordinator at NCFH, and I'll be helping facilitate the Q&A. If you have any questions, please be sure to submit those. Uh, you should have a Q&A option to the right side of your screen. And any questions can be submitted there, and we can address those at this time. If you have any questions uh, for uh, Dr. Lyons or uh, Mr. Jim McCray, since we didn't have that option earlier. And I have not seen any come through yet. So, but if you think of them as we proceed um, with uh, the additional information for the conference, please submit those and we'll address those in um, a few minutes before we conclude. Um, we do hope that everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. We have 10 tracks with 48 educational sessions presented by experts from around the country. Be sure to take advantage of chances to win prizes by attending the sessions, asking questions, visiting the exhibitors and the sponsor booths. And we will be having um, the first break with the exhibitors immediately following this plenary session. And we do ask that you please be sure to complete your uh, valuation surveys in each session that you attend. At the end of the forum, you will be sent an overall evaluation survey as well. And we do thank you in advance for your feedback, which is very valuable in identifying training priorities and providing uh, quality educational opportunities. So um, we thank you again, and we hope you enjoy the conference, and we hope to see you in person next year. And don't forget to join us for tomorrow's morning plenary with an update from the National Association of Community Health Centers by Rachel Gonzalez Hansen and a keynote presentation by Emmy Award winning journalist Maria Hinojosa. So um, I don't have any questions at this time unless some of our presenters, speakers, um, CEOs have any additional comments before we conclude. Yeah, maybe just uh, Alfonso here, just quickly to say that uh, again, the, uh, any comments, uh, suggestions you have, our, our our contact information, I believe, will be shared. And uh, so, any ideas, needs uh, for follow up, or any question you can think, so please don't hesitate to to contact me. We'll be very happy to you know follow up with any of you who have many uh, many specific issues or you would like to further uh, discuss or explore. So, thank you again very much. And the same from where we sit, if you provided our contact information, please reach and reach out to us. Um, we do have a very strong partnership uh, between HRSA and CDC, um, especially around the vaccine program. But honestly, it's really grown from there in terms of all of the work that we're doing. So we're, we're really excited about um, the information sharing, the, the work together, and everything that we're doing um, to help support you, again, on the front lines, our essential workers, um, in terms of the work. So again, just a huge thank you for everything that you're doing and look forward to uh, seeing you all hopefully soon, shortly in person. Um, but this has been great and really big congratulations to you all for organizing this session today and, and during the whole week. So thank you. Thank you so much. We have uh, some time now. I don't know, Sylvia, if we have any other questions. Uh, but if we don't, I want to thank uh, Jim and Alfonso, Bruce and Chris, all of our staff who have put this together. They have done an amazing job. As Sylvia Gomez said, we have a lot of educational sessions planned throughout the week. Uh, we hope to see you at as many as you can uh, attend. We know that all of you are very busy um, at the health centers and within other organizations that are responding to the needs of our community. So um, please take the time this week to uh, join us for these educational sessions, spend time with your colleagues. That has been one of the focuses and one of the real benefits of the stream forums. Traditionally, it's not only a time for us to gather and get some um, new information, learn about promising practices, 
but it's also a time for us to share with our colleagues and peers. And although we're having to do that virtually, um, we welcome you to um, interact as much as possible through the other um, venues that we have available, either through the exhibits or sponsors, and certainly a dialogue in the educational sessions. I encourage you to use the chat so that we can hear from you and uh, make this a more robust and interactive process. Uh, Bruce and Chris, I don't know if you have uh, like to have some closing remarks. Hi, Sylvia, thanks for asking. I wonder if I could ask a question of Alfonso and Jim. I'd just love to hear a little bit more. And Alfonso, thank you very much that what you outlined as that CDC program is, is really ex very exciting. And we'd love to hear a little bit about the partnership between HRSA and CDC. And Jim, your thoughts about how there might be coordination in moving forward with that, because that really is, I think, historic in seeing CDC's commitment to, to moving forward and developing out this, this farm worker network. Alfonso, do you want to start? Absolutely. I think that opens uh, a tremendous, like the Jim said, we, I mean, for historically, CDC and HRSA have been collaborating very closely on many issues. I think that through this response, uh, that collaboration has increased. We've been exchanging information, I think, that uh, in, in ideas and in, in, in projects, and we want to be complementary. I think the great opportunity that we have is that uh, HRSA is already, and actually this the partnership that we created was uh, based on the, uh, the farm work help network that HRSA has already uh, implemented uh, that is focused on community health centers. So we try to, to see how we complement how, how can we complement that by also seeing more on the on the field, the uh, local uh, you know, outreach activities that complement what is being done in the community health centers. Uh, one area that we also we have been uh, you know collaborating, I think, but we have uh, still opportunities is in the area of data. Uh, there is data being collected in community health centers. There is data being collected by CDC, but nobody has really a complete or good picture of the uh, the burden of uh, COVID nineteen among farm workers. Uh, so I think that's another you know opportunity to to collaborate, and, and again, how to use the the networks or the or the connection that we have to 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 coordinate better activities and to help each other. Uh, what I'm very impressed is that there is a very historic strong network of organizations. So it's really about coordinating, linking, avoiding duplication, finding the gaps so we, we can have better efficiency to really better serve uh, these, uh, the, these communities. So it's really out there in front of us. And we have learned so much through this, uh, uh, this uh, pandemic that is really how can we uh, really uh, systematize it and operationalize it better the support that we have. So, so, so again, as uh, we are very busy with, uh, you know, responding to our emergencies, and uh, uh, but I think that going the extra step to try to work across agencies, I think that you know it can really have help, you know, all of us, and also ultimately help the way that we serve uh, farm workers. And also, what I want to say that because I forgot, this is also an open inv invitation to connect with uh, uh, the National Center for Farm Worker Health. For organizations who are interested in participating in this network, we really, really welcome uh, other organizations that, that still we may not have a chance to connect with uh, that would like to participate in this uh, joint effort. Yeah, and I'll just add, yeah. we're very excited, we're very excited. as an opportunity in terms of, um, <laughs> oops, we got a little bit of feedback going on here. Not sure what's going on, but, <laughs> but we're just very excited about it. I think. Um, you know, one of the, I mean, it's been such an incredibly challenging year, but I think one of the things that we found over time is new partnerships or existing partnerships that we can further strengthen. And I think, again, the work that um, CDC is doing, the work that we're doing, the, the work that the National Center for Farm Worker Health is doing, um, and a number of you all um, out in the field really making an impact um, is going to be critically important. Um, one of the other partners that we've just recently engaged with around uh, farm worker health has been the FDA in terms of agriculture and being able to track, you know, where the harvests are happening and what's um, being utilized. So we've actually shared data just most recently with our colleagues in FDA to, uh, as Alfonso said, bring all of these different pieces together um, into one sort of coherent picture so that we can all do a better job 
um, providing re resources and services to our patients and the communities that could most uh, benefit from it. And I think COVID-19 has really put a spotlight on that, but I think what I see is really an opportunity for us to grow and develop this over time um, to make a bigger impact over the long term on the health and well-being of um, migrant seasonal farm workers all across the country. So look forward to Alfonso catching back up with you. We were actually sharing text messages back and forth um, to see if we can connect after this uh, in terms of some of the work too. So thanks, Bruce. Okay, hello again, everyone. I just wanted to point out um, that um, in this particular session, you will not see the chat box. There is actually uh, a Q&A button that has been placed on your screen. You should see it at the bottom. The middle of the screen is a little blue question mark that has Q&A underneath it. And if you click on that, then you can open it up and enter your questions there. So if you do have any questions, I can go ahead and, and look at that um, for any questions you may be submitting that we can address at this time. Okay, and I'm not seeing any coming through. I just wanna be sure that we do address any that you may have. Okay, well, no questions at this time. Again, um, you have the contact information for our speakers. And uh, if you have any questions as well, you can feel free to contact me, Sylvia Gomez, at gomez at ncfh.org. And I can make sure that we get those to our um, speakers um, for today's session. So again, thank you very much. And we hope you all enjoy the conference. We've got some great sessions lined up, great exhibits and sponsors, and um, you know, great staff um, here representing uh, NWRPCA, NCCHCA, and our staff at NCFH. So enjoy the conference, everyone.